try also try without a mic. I hope that's okay. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, now we switch to a completely different uh, subject, which is <laughs> one of the appealing things of Mediterranean studies, but uh, sometimes also a little bit tricky and. Uh, Okay, so we come now to the Bronze Age, yeah, so we go back uh, into time several thousand years, I have to say. And um, I'm an archaeologist, maybe I have to say this in advance. And um, of course, archaeology is a subject which is maybe not, I mean, of course, it is humanities, it is a historical science, so this is for the age in the AH list, so that makes sense. But of course, it's also taking. Um, I don't know, parts from other disciplines, and so it's not a real discipline in itself, you could say, it's always taking from others and somehow putting them together. Um, so I hope it makes sense what I'm, also for you, you know, who are more concerned with the humanities, and of course, um, I, I will come to other points as well, you know, maybe also to digital humanities and stuff like that, what we talked about last, uh, yesterday. Um, so this is actually yeah, the roadmap for today. Um, I will shortly talk about the Bronze Age, the Mycenaean civilization, um, which is actually the reason why I thought that um, this conference makes sense for my presentation, because uh, the topic is inclusiveness, interdependence, and interconnectedness. And this is exactly the point uh, when we talk about the Bronze Age in the Mediterranean. Um, then I will come to Istria, the place uh, where my research takes place, and I will introduce a few sites um, where I did research and other scholars did research, and then I try to see the, the wholeness of Istria. And then we come to the digital humanities, actually. So why is the Bronze Age so important when we talk about the Mediterranean? Of course, one of the keywords of the Mediterranean is like interconnectedness, um, and the Bronze Age actually is the time when people have to go out and have to meet each other. They cannot avoid it. Why is that? Because bronze is actually an alloy. It means it consists of two different components. Um, it's copper on one side. Usually it's tin. There are also some other elements, but uh, usually it's tin and you have to mix both to get bronze. And it is like that, that usually both of these elements do not exist close to each other in the Mediterranean. So it means one community has maybe access to copper, the other one has access to tin. Um, if they want to make bronze, usually both of them are interested in that, so they have to meet somewhere, or they have to get into exchange with each other. It's a necessity. Um, I mean, this is of course only one of the reasons why people get in contact with each other in the Mediterranean. We know that um, Horden and uh, Prusel, for example, mentioned that, that of, of course also the idea to avoid risk is um, one of the um, triggers to do that. But especially in the time of the Bronze Age, um, yeah, the, the, the pursuit for the resources is very important. Uh, just to uh, maybe to let you know about the time I'm talking about here, we have the chronological system. Um, let's say in Istria, the Bronze Age starts maybe around 2400. I'm, I'm a little bit careful about these uh, times. Let's say 2400 uh, BC and goes um, until 1200 BC. Okay, so the Mycenaean civilization is um, yeah, important in many aspects and uh, the eponymous site which gives the name to the civilization is Mykene. You can go there, it's a quite um, famous tourist site in Greece and um, it is actually yeah, one of the parts that is, is a kind of role model for other places, for other sites we have in the Aegean Sea. And um, basically, we have a palace or a temple site, sometimes with fortification, not always, but usually with a strong fortification. You can see this is actually uh, very famous, the Lion Gate and the big fortification at Mykine. And this is formed out of big blocks. And it's, yeah, it's, it's very big. And of course, it is not only for fortifying or protecting this area. It's also a symbol for the power of these people who are living there. And uh, we can say this is a centralized system, so we have 
smaller settlements in the surrounding who um, bring in resources to the central settlement and then there's some redistribution going on. Of course, they're using it, for example, for paying specialized um, professions or offices. For example, they had scribes at this time. Um, so they get all paid by that, but of course, um, I don't know if there's some shortage, at least we think so, then um, some of the stuff which is stored inside the central sites is also given again to the smaller settlements. So it's also actually a strategy of risk management, you could say. Um, generally, when we look at the Mediterranean at the Bronze Age, uh, particularly the Eastern Mediterranean is quite important because uh, we have um, a lot of other yeah, states, we could say we can call them states, uh, emerging there and they were interrelated uh, through um, exchange, of course, of trades, but also exchange, um, I don't know, there's diplomatic exchange and so on. So they are really, really closely affiliated and the Mycenaean um, civilization is part of that. And, you know, one of the indicators that are telling us how the contacts were going on there is, for example, the um, distribution of the pottery, of Mycenaean pottery. Um, and you can see, for example, that um, it is, I don't know if you can really see that on the map, hmm, maybe not that good. You know, I have this uh, areas here, for example, and uh, which show a high density of uh, Mycenaean pottery. And this, for example, in the Levant, we have it in Egypt, we have it, of course, in Asia Minor, and uh, we have it in Italy, Sicily, Sardinia, and also here in the uh, Po Valley, which is not so far away from the place of Istria. Mm, so, and the basic idea is, of course, when there's some exchange, then people usually do not only exchange goods or something like this, of course, they also exchange ideas and influence each other in many ways. So, then let's come now to Istria. Istria is um, today politically, or the biggest part actually belongs to Croatia, and I think Croatia is also a country which is very often overlooked uh, by Mediterranean studies, which is, um, I don't know why, because actually, you know, many parts of that are clearly a Mediterranean country. Not all, maybe not all is really Mediterranean in a sense. You can see here that, um, for example, yeah, Slavonia is, of course, more inside this inland Balkan area, but clearly here you have uh, huge parts of the country are along the Mediterranean, the Adriatic uh, coast. So um, if you, for example, come to Istria, what you see is a clearly Mediterranean landscape. Uh, people cultivate olives there, they have wine. Um, the whole landscape is a so-called cast landscape. Yeah, this uh, kind of erosion, when limestone is uh, eroding, then you have all these kind of steep cliffs coming out and stones and everything. So you're definitely in the Mediterranean, and just maybe for your orientation, this is the so-called Caput Adriae, which is the northern part of the Adriatic Sea, and here, for example, this is the location of Venice. So you can today also go by ship, for example, from Istria to Venice. So. <coughs> yeah, just maybe a short impression. If you haven't been there, then just mm. go there. It really looks like this, okay? <laughs> this is not a Photoshop version or something like this. It's the city of Rovin on the western coast of Istria, and it's really that beautiful. And it was, for example, also part of the Venetian Republic. Uh, you can see that, for example, yeah, when you see the, the church and everything, that it has this kind of Venetian architecture and everything. So if you haven't been there, you know, and usually travel maybe to other places, then maybe consider to go to Istria or to other places in Croatia. That makes sense. Uh, okay, but now uh, let's come to the Bronze Age, actually, to the Bronze Age settlements in uh, Istria. So we know about 436 sites. Um, on this map, we have 423 mapped because uh, in some cases we don't know the exact location of them. Um, so this is actually a collection, kind of meticulous collection over, you can say, 100 years. People, scholars were going uh, into the area and uh, surveying the area, as we call it, and collecting artifacts and stuff you can find on the surface. And then we can classify, we can say, okay, this is, for example, pottery from the Bronze Age. Uh, so we have quite a lot of sites, and that's, uh, you know, that's a big advantage. Usually uh, in other areas you have really big blank spots and you don't know well about it. The strange thing is, however, that most of these sites were not excavated, or there was no, like, modern excavation uh, work didn't take place. 
So we know there are these uh, Bronze Age settlements, but we don't know anything else. There are, however, now three exceptions, and you can see that here. Uh, one, this is Rovin, the city I just showed you before the pictures. And there is one site which is called Moncodonia that was excavated in the, ooh, I don't bring it together, from the nine, maybe from 1997, I think, until 2005 or so, by the Institute uh, of Prehistoric Archaeology in Berlin, so my old institute where I studied. And uh, recently we excavated, this is actually a project funded by the um, research foundation in Korea, quite interesting, yeah, some uh, research, excavation uh, research here and other sites close by. And we have usually two basic questions, or first, first of all we have two questions, we have many, many more, but first of all, were all these Bronze Age sites, sediments occupied at the same time? Of course, this is really difficult to answer, you know, because uh, you cannot to really answer that you have to excavate each site and have to compare that. Uh, in case of 436 or even 400 sites, it's an impossible task, so we cannot do this. We can just check here and there a little bit. And the other question is, are there any indicators for a centralized hierarch hierarchical settlement structure, which we can find, for example, in the Mycenaean civilization and other places? So I'm going now to show you a few results um, of the field work, and then I come back to the digital humanities and trying to answer at least a little bit these questions. So the site of Moncodonia is uh, so far the best excavated place, so over yeah, several years, more than 10 years, um, in several campaigns. And usually the sites, and that makes it also very, quite interesting, the settlement sites are on these elevations, and the whole landscape is full of these elevations. They are also not used today, or not many of them, for agricultural purposes. And if you go there, usually they are covered by vegetation quite a lot. Um, but you go there and you can really see the remains of the old settlements and of the old occupation because people were building the structures, for example, the fortifications out of dry stone or in dry stone technique using the limestone, the local limestone. And this is what you can even see today in some places. So this is just a reconstruction here of um, excavated parts. And uh, Mongodonia is yeah, not only interesting because it is the best excavated place, it is also one of the bigger places. It has around three and a half hectare of size, quite big. And it has several fortification circles here. And the fortification itself is quite complicated and again, um, here we have maybe also the bridge to Mykena because it is quite clear that the fortification was not only used for protecting the settlement. For example, there were also the graves or particular graves were inside the fortification. So it's like the ancestors holding the fortification and protecting the settlement in some way. Um, so you can see here some of the reconstructed structures um, from the excavation. So we have um, several gates and um, also house uh, floors and stuff. Actually, not everything is maybe, um, when, you, when you read the report of the excavators, it's not easy to follow all the interpretation, but at least um, I think generally it's okay. And we have also, for example, you can see the, the remains of one of these um, graves inside the fortification. And then we have also something I'm not really sure if you can, uh, the picture is quite dark. We have, for example, these two rock spikes coming up. Yeah? The excavators compared, for example, with the horns of consecration, which uh, are kind of iconic um, symbol of the Minoan and the Mycenaean civilization. Of course, um, you know, it's uh, up to you if you can follow this idea or not. I'm also a little bit skeptical. There are good reasons to think, yeah, that might be true. Of course, you shouldn't forget um, that also erosion took place and, you know, like um, 4,000 years ago that they might have looked a little bit different. So these are some of the artifacts uh, from Moncodonia. Um, they are not as spectacular, at least at first sight, uh, at first sight what we know from, um, yeah, from the Mycenaean civilization or other Eastern Mediterranean civilizations, but um, so we have a lot of pottery, we also have bronze, so yeah, we are in the Bronze Age, so we can clearly recognize that. And we have, for example, from the graves, we have this here, uh, parts of necklaces, and these quite unspectacular 
beads here, they are actually made of amber. Mm -hmm. yeah, and amber is something you cannot, you can find it in the Mediterranean, but usually not um, in Istria. So you have to go to other places. So again, we have this aspect of exchange. Yeah? The people in Istria must have been in some kind of exchange or communication network. But most of the amber is actually coming from the Baltic, Baltic Sea area, which is another Mediterranean in this sense. Yeah, And there was this um, uh, so-called amber road going through Middle Europe down to um, Istria, at least in later times. So it's quite possible that also in the Bronze Age we have this um, exchange. Okay, so assumptions by the excavators of Mongodonia. So for example, that Mongodonia was a central settlement, they estimate a population of like, you know, thousand inhabitants. And they think that this settlement controlled also the surrounding area. Here, this is some suggestion they made. Um, this is some uh, space between different areas of influence. So you can see this uh, are central or what they think are central settlements and one of them is Mongodonia, and then you have smaller settlements which are uh, in a kind of peripheral uh, position, so it's set like satellite settlements. One, so one argument for that is the size of the, of the settlement, because it's the biggest, the other ones are significantly smaller, as, as much as we know. And um, we also have, for example, remains of bones, and uh, so from sheep and goats, but also of fishes, which tell us that um, particular fishes, for example, were just brought to Mongodonia. So there was a pre-selection and the people living there just using particular kinds of food. Uh, and these are, as biologists would say, or zoologists would say, these are better parts of the animal which were consumed there. So that's why it's the idea that maybe um, the people were in a kind of elevated position uh, in the social stratification of this area and that other settlements somehow contributed um, their resources to Mongodonia. So we have also maybe this kind of centralized system um, and a redistribution system, maybe. And the other assumption is that uh, the settlement, or generally, yeah, that the settlement, that the population in the settlement um, was stratified in four basic groups and they um, connected actually to the division of the settlement because we can uh, distinguish maybe for at least three different areas. So here, for example, on top is, I don't know, the place of the, the, the elite or the uh, upper layer people. Then we have something like also upper stratum, but a little bit below. And then we have the lower stratum, and then they also made some fringe group of people who cannot live in the settlement or something like this, but for them we don't have so much evidences. Um, this is of course basically, uh, it's also a little bit supported by the artifacts. For example, we can find that um, particular artifacts are especially in the center, um, which are connected to um, elite lifestyle and something like that. And other um, artifacts here in this area, for example, are more connected to storage and something like that. But I believe there's maybe also a functional component inside. It's not only a social one, but anyway, of course it's a start. So now come to the sites which are um, the topic of the recent um, or the current research project and one of them is Monbrodo and you can see, so it's actually a slight elevation, yeah, it's not very high. Um, you can also in the satellite pictures, for example, you can see here um, some structures, yeah, some circular structures uh, on this hill, um, which gives already a hint maybe there could be some kind of fortification or, or whatever. Fortunately, there was also a project, so-called leader scanning of this area, uh, which gives us more insight because uh, if you walk through this forest, you can, I mean, you have a lot of trees and everything, but you don't really get what the structures, where they are going. And so you can recognize them, but you have no idea, for example, if a wall is circular, it's just semicircular or something like that. And uh, the good thing about this uh, leader laser scanning is that it, um, the scanning the surface and it can reduce or completely delete the, um, the vegetation. So trees and everything is just deleted on this picture and you can see how the surface really looks like. And you can see that, for example, Mongolia has several of these kind of, um, yeah, maybe wall structures, or there are wall structures, I can tell you because I, I saw it by myself. And uh, some of them are semi-circular, but then we have two circular things and you can see here also, um, display, I hope you can see it, by the way, yeah, maybe a little bit. 
um, where we actually made our trenches to for the excavation. And this is how it looks like, for example. So this is one of the outer wall, maybe just to explain. We know that here, for example, is a big um, dry stone wall, and it was not really clear, is it from the Bronze Age, from other times. It turned out it's not from the Bronze Age, it's actually from the Iron Age, yeah, a little bit later. Um, but we found actually the Bronze Age fortification. Um, here, actually, the, the photograph is made standing on top of this one here. Yeah, This is a big wall from the Bronze Age which is a little bit more inside the settlement and it was not visible through any kind of laser scanning or a satellite picture or something like this. This just came out by using, I mean, making real field work. So that's also a good argument, yeah, not to abandon all the old methods and something like this. Um, sometimes you really have to dig inside and to find stuff and you have to get the artifacts um, to figure out what's going on. Um, yeah, so here just um, the drawing. So this is actually the Iron Age wall, you know, from, from above. That's a planum, and then you can see the structure. This is from the Bronze Age, and the gray area is actually the, bron uh, the Bronze Age layers we cut into. You can see this also here on the profile. So this is Bronze Age, this is all later, which is quite important. It's not so important for the Bronze Age discussion here. Okay. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's important for um, having a sequence of artifacts, which was not provided by Moncodonia. Okay, Monvi is a quite recent um, excavation. I have to prepare the, the report for that, so just a few pictures. Um, it's not as um, impressive as the finds from Moncodonia, but you can see maybe here, um, we have recent dry stone wall, but the basis is made by these big blocks, and these big blocks usually are connected to older times, to prehistoric times, because the wall was not just made for making a kind of uh, demarcation line or something like that. It was made for, um, yeah, also to show somehow the power of the settlement. So what we know now is that all these three settlements, which are in close proximity to each other, were occupied at the same time, at the Bronze Age. Um, so it means that we have actually a quite dense population here in this area. Um, but as I mentioned, um, we have more, this, more, uh, more than 400 sites, we cannot all excavate them, so this is now where we actually take other tools inside to somehow estimate if there's a possibility, um, not if they were at this, uh, occupied at the same time, this is really something we can only figure out by excavation. There are good reasons to believe that, by the way, um, but to figure out if these settlements and what kind of relation they stood to each other. So. Um, maybe the most, I, I will flip through a little bit, maybe the most uh, um, interesting one is this one here. This is actually a kind of intervisibility inter analysis, yeah, which you can make with uh, some GIS tools. And it means you have, um, you measure, you just draw a line from one sediment to the other one, from where you can, which you can see, actually. So, for example, when you're here in the sediment, you can see this one, you can see this one, and you can see this one. And what you can see is that we have here a network. So all of these settlements were somehow connected in a communication network. Yeah, if we equal visibility also with communication, which is um, at least possible, yeah, quite likely in some way. And um, we see that we have different kind of um, yeah, densities here. Yeah? Some different areas which maybe belong to different groups. But this is just um, a starting point. We can we don't know that at the moment. We have to compare the artifacts and everything. But this is a first start, and it shows actually that here, when we use a tool which is also subsumed under the umbrella term of digital humanities, of course, from a different angle, yeah, not like uh, for literature or something like this, but in archaeology, it's the same. Um, then it just gives us particular hints where we should look like but it doesn't give us any explanation about anything. You know, This is something we have to do. We still have to think about it and we still have to find the evidences in the end. It's just a possibility which is open to us. Um, so the results of the fieldwork is that it seems like that at least parts of Istria were part of a, a hierarchical settlement system. We have bigger and smaller settlement which existed at the same time. Um, the GIS-based analysis show that actually all Bronze Age settlements in Istria were part of a communication system, and um, particular areas, these are these places of higher density, are obviously closer affiliated to each other. 
So it's very likely that we have a Bronze Age um, <coughs> hierarchical settlement system in Istria, but if it is really something that came maybe from the Mycenaean civilization or from somewhere else, of course, up to ongoing research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.